out previous sins. Someone may say, I would like to repent, but what's the certainty that I'll be forgiven? I would like to change my ways, but my mind is invaded by uncertainties. For I to be sure of being forgiven, surely I would repent. The answer is, this thought is nothing new. It used to worry even the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here are two instances. The first, which is related by Imam Muslim, Rahimahullah, the story of Amr ibn Al-As, radiallahu anhu, who narrated himself. He says, when Islam had taken root in my heart, I went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Spread out your hand so that I may take the bay'ah. He thrust forward his right hand, and I held it in mine without taking the oath. He asked, What's the matter with you, Amr? He said, I said, Well, I would like to make it conditional. And what's the condition? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I said, That I be forgiven. He said, Don't you know, Amr? that Islam wipes out previous sins, that Hijra wipes out previous sins, and that Hajj wipes out previous sins. The second example has been preserved by Imam Muslim, and he reports that Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, as saying that some people of the pagans had committed many murders and had indulged in excessive adultery in the days of Jahiliyyah. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. They came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and said, "What you offer and call us to is quite appealing. But if you could only let us know if there is a possibility of atonement for our previous sins, Allah سبحانه وتعالى then revealed this auspicious ayah." والذين لا يضعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يل ومن يفعل ذلك يلق أثاما. The true servants of Allah are those who do not call upon Allah other gods or do not call another god with Allah. Who do not slay the soul Allah has forbidden, who save except by right or justification, and do not commit adultery. And whoever does this, he shall surely meet the price of sin. And Allah also revealed, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Tell them, O my slaves who have wronged their souls, do not despair of Allah's mercy. And this chapter, the next chapter, is the last chapter we'll read, inshallah. Will Allah forgive me? Sometimes a man asks, I would like to repent, but I have such a huge collection and such a wide variety of evil deeds in my account that I don't know if Allah will forgive me. The Sheikh says, أقول لك أيها الأخ الكريم. Let me tell you, my respected brother, in reply, that this is not your specific problem, but that of many a young man who wants to repent his sins. Let me give you the example of a young man. He started his career of sin at a very early age. Now I have to uh, tell you, brothers, the sheikh, the, the, the young man who the sheikh is talking about, is himself. The young man who the Sheikh is talking about is himself. He says, by the time he had reached 17 years of his age, there was not a sin, major or minor, that he had not committed teaming up with the people of all sorts, young and old. He had even committed indecencies with a little girl, adding to the list thefts committed on various occasions. I take that back. This is not the Sheikh. This is enough. The Sheikh has something else. This is not the Sheikh. I take that back. Then he repented, began to do his tahajjud, fast every Monday and Thursday and read the Quran after every morning prayer but he used to ask is this repentance acceptable to Allah our answer to him and to every sinner 
is that we should always turn to the Quran and Sunnah to find out what they have to say about the problem at hand and what is the cure and solution they offer. When we refer to the Quran, in this regard, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorified be He, tells us, tell them, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the verse is, the English translation of it, or the Arabic of it is, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَغْفِرُ ذُنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلَمُوا لَهُ O my slaves who have wronged their souls, do not despair of Allah's mercy, for Allah will forgive all sins. He is indeed very forgiving, very compassionate, so turn to Him then and obey Him in all your affairs. This then is the answer which does not need further elucidation. As for the thought that sins are so numerous that Allah may not forgive them, if this thought arises, first of all, from a lack of faith, and it rises because, it rises because first of all, from a lack of faith and knowledge of the magnitude of Allah's mercy. Secondly, it arises because of the lack of appreciation of Allah's capability to forgive any number of sins. Thirdly, it indicates failure on the part of the penitent to come up with another important deed of the heart, which is hope. And fourthly, it is a lack of appreciation of the way in which repentance can wipe out sins. We, sure, we shall therefore discuss each of these points a little more in detail. As for the first, it should be enough to quote Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ My mercy has encompassed everything. As for the second, a hadith Qudsi should be enough to quote where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, قَالَ تَعَالَى مَنْ عَلِمَ أَنِّي ذُو قُدْرَةٍ عَلَى مَغْفِرَةِ الزُّنُوبِ غَفَرْتُ لَهُ وَلَا أُبَالِي مَا لَمْ يُشْفِكْ بِي شَيْئًا Allah says, he who knows for a surety and in the depths of his heart and in the bowels of his soul believes that I forgive all sins, then I do forgive all sins and I don't mind. So long as he does not suggest partners commit shirk with me. And the rule will be applied, continues the prophet, in the hereafter. As for the third, another hadith should, should, should offer the cure. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يا ابن آدم إنك ما دعوتني ورجوتني غفرت لك على ما كان منك ولا أبالي يا ابن آدم لو بلغت ذنوبك عنان السماء ثم استغفرتني غفرت لك ولا أبالي يا ابن آدم لو أنك أتيتني بقراب الأرض خطايا ثم لقيتني ثم لقيتني لا تشرك بي شيئا لأتيتك بقرابها مغفرة O son of Adam if you supplicate me and fasten good hopes on me I shall forgive all your sins and I don't mind O son of Adam if your sins were to reach the limits of the sky and then you seek my forgiveness I shall forgive you and I don't care O son of Adam if you will bring sins equal in volume to the earth and then you meet me on the day of judgment. In the state that you would have not suggested partners unto me, I shall forgive you and return forgiveness equal to the volume of the earth. And as for the fourth, there's another hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we'll end it here, inshallah ta'ala, where the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam said, and this hadith is collected by Imam Ibn Majah, and all of these hadiths are authentic. He said, التَّائِبُ مِنَ الذَّنْبَ كَمَنْ لَا ذَنْبَ لَهُ He who repents is like him who had no sin in the first place. He, he who repents is like him who has no sin at all. In addition, for the sake of everyone who thinks that the forgiveness of his sins is a doubtful affair, we narrate tomorrow morning, inshallah ta'ala, as a fajr, the hadith that follows in the next section. 
And anyone who wants some further explanation of this, there's a tape from the khutbah that I did a few months back, is that uh, whoever, uh, those who swear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين أجمعين في كل مكان سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك and tonight may be ليلة القدر tonight is the 27th night of Ramadan you should pour out your hearts brothers ask Allah to forgive you ask Allah to have mercy on you beg Allah to pardon you ask Allah to increase you in iman and taqwa and all those things that are good for our souls because this Ramadan is almost over Laylatul Qadr, if it hasn't already passed, is the night when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all sins and everything that's going to happen to you for the year is written down. So we should ask Allah for the best and seek refuge with Him from the worst and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the highest place in paradise which is Il Firdaus, Nuzula, insha'Allah ta'ala. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. 27th night. Any uh, statements, comments, questions about this, brothers? No. It's like giving them pork. Silk rule. He gave it to somebody else. Inshallah, we'll ask about the meaning of hadith, this hadith from Abu Usama. I remember what the Sheikh mentioned, uh, said about when he explained it. I mean, I remember the uh, Sheikh explaining this one time we were in Mecca, but I don't remember the explanation. Yeah, this would be a proof, but, but this, this particular thing is a little bit differently, though. I think because silk. I think because the material itself, because it's haram, this is a little bit different. Yeah. Because haram in Islam, and I'm only giving uh, my two cent understanding without, you know, we'll find out what Abu Sama says about it. But I know that from the principles of Sharia, that haram has two types. They're both haram, but there's two types of haram. There's one called haram li dhatihi, and there's one called haram li ghayrihi. Haram li dhatihi is something that's intrinsically haram. Intrinsically haram. And the haram li that li ghayrihi is a haram that because of some circumstances, some external circumstances, it becomes haram. But wasn't necessarily haram in the beginning. You see? It may be something that's permissible. But because of the external circumstances, or extenuating circumstances, or conditions, it becomes haram. Alright? And silk is one of those things, and so is gold. Gold and silk are not intrinsically, naturally, innately haram. But because of the wisdom from Allah, He tells the men not to wear it. But they can still sell it, you can still hold it in your hand, etc. Nothing wrong with holding silk in your hand. But pork is intrinsically haram. Alcohol, crack, heroin are intrinsically haram. Haram li zatihi, you see. Zina is intrinsically haram. Fornication is intrinsically, intrinsically haram. That's right, see. That's another issue, that's another fiqh issue connected to that. You're right. But so we ask Abu Sam, inshallah, about why, with, with the hukum on this, the Prophet giving this, and the meaning behind it, inshallah, if he's still, if he's still around. Yeah, well, this is, like, this is another, that's, that's not, that has nothing to do with this. Those are exceptions. Yeah. خياركم في الجاهلية وخياركم في الإسلام انفقه. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said the best of you in jahiliya or the best of you in Islam provided that he has an understanding of the deen. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Right, like those honorable people of the past, our salaf, Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman and Ali, for instance. Abu Bakr and, o- and Omar. Abu Bakr never worshipped idols and never drank alcohol in jahiliya. Omar did. All right? So Abu Bakr, when he came to Islam, and when Omar came to Islam, 
because of the good qualities that Abu Bakr had in, in Jahiliyyah, once he became understanding of the deen of Islam, he became good in, in Islam. You see? You may have a person, and I'm not singling myself out, but people that know me know I used to stand on broad market when I was in the so-called nation of Islam, and I used to rap, and I knew all the lessons, all the lessons that Elijah Muhammad sent us from Chicago. You know, I knew all those lessons. And I used to be rapping, man, rapping to people, bringing people to the, te- to the temple, bringing them to the temple, bringing them to the temple, right? I used to be real, real good at that stuff, right? So I'm not saying that I'm good at this now, but that's an example. A person who may have some good qualities in Jahiliya, if he gets an understanding of Islam, right? When he comes into Islam, those qualities that he brought with him, he'll be good in Islam. See? Guy was an expert drug dealer. Expert drug dealer. I mean, he was slinging par excellence, right? He comes to Islam, and he uses his... Well, you got to have knowledge of business if you're selling drugs. You've got to have knowledge, Zach. No, seriously. To be a successful drug dealer, you've got to have knowledge, man. You probably could teach a class in economics or business administration in any of these colleges if you're successful in it. And I mean successful meaning you're getting paid without getting busted. Right? All right? That person brings that knowledge into Islam, and then he uses his, his business sense, his street survey, for being. You see? خياركم في الجاهلية خياركم في الإسلام The best of you in Jahiliya are the best of you in Islam. Provided that he has a fit of the deen. That he has an understanding of the deen. He understands his deen. See? But if you don't understand the deen, you're going to be worse. In Jahiliya and in Islam. I mean, no difference. If you're stupid, you're stupid. Right? <laughs> Whether you're a calf or you're a Muslim. <laughs> right? So basically, that's the meaning. And Allah knows best. I feel like they got dynamite in their chest. You better hope that that dynamite don't explode before you die. You better hope that that dynamite you got in your chest and them rocks you got in your jaws right now don't, don't explode and you swallow them before you die. Because some of you have been making this man a God besides Allah. And you don't realize it because you don't know what Islam is. And you don't know what worship is. And you don't know about shirk al-par and shirk al See, that's the problem. You don't know what is the polytheism of love and obedience. Keep following this stuff. Interpreting the Quran by yourself. Allah says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرِ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَنْ نُزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ This is what Allah says in the Quran. We have revealed this dhikr, the Quran, to you, Muhammad wasallam, so that you, Muhammad, can explain to the people what was revealed to them. Revealed for them. SubhanAllah. How in the world are you going to open up the Quran and interpret it yourself? I don't care how much Arabic language you have. The Arabs in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they were masters in the Arabic language, and they didn't even understand it. Even the Sahaba themselves, there are verses that they didn't understand themselves. Omar sallallahu anhu, he was listening to, he was reciting a verse. He came to a word "abba," a simple word like "abba," and he didn't know what it meant. He didn't know what it meant. Now, how are you with a two-cent education, Arabic language? Don't know any of the principles of tafsir, any of the principles of usul hadith, any of the principles of alum al-Qur'an, going to interpret the Qur'an. SubhanAllah. No, but the Qur'an was revealed as easy, it's easy for everybody to understand. No, it's not. No, it's not. Don't believe that. It's not easy. That's why he sent a messenger. To explain it. If that was the case, he could have just sent it down, and everybody just go get a copy, and then read it, and interpret it. Why did he send a, a prophet so long to explain it? Because it's not that easy. SubhanAllah. You brothers, I'm telling you, if you don't pick up this banner at the defense of Islam, and we're not talking about jihad, we're fighting with guns and stuff like that. That's part of Islam too, once again, for the FBI. I'm talking about defending the Quran. Defending this Quran from corruption. This is madness, but alhamdulillah, among them, there are people now who are rising up, who are saying, man, this is crazy. This is crazy now. This is just, this is, after 20 years, this is too much now. After 20 years, they finally, some people finally realized that this is crazy. I'm not going to go on with this thing about repentance, inshallah, but uh, Ibn Qasim has something to say. No. No. There is a hadith that uh, says whoever uh, says something about the Quran with his own ra'i, even if he's correct, that uh, he has sinned. And this one is not authentic either. But still, we still know from the verses of Quran and from other hadiths 
that you can't uh, say things about a lot of that you don't have knowledge about, about his book, et cetera. Um, Ajahn, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, uh, Muqtasid, Jazawullah uh, Khaira, may Allah reward him immensely. I mean, he, he brought um, uh, a reference to this particular, uh, where is it? Yeah, it's an, and it's a reference to another ayah where Allah says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Surely we have revealed or we have sent down the dhikr of the Qur'an and surely we will guard it. Guard it meaning from corruption. And then it has a note here. This verse is a challenge to mankind and everyone is obliged to believe in the miracles of this Qur'an. It is a clear fact that more than 1,400 years have elapsed and not a single word of this Qur'an has been changed. Although the disbelievers try their utmost to change it, with, every, with each and every way, but they failed miserably in their efforts. As is mentioned in this sacred holy verse, we will guard it by Allah. He has guarded it. On the contrary, all the other books, the Torah and the Injil, have been corrupted in the form of additions or subtractions or alterations in the original text. And just like Allah khair. <clears throat> so we would like to continue. But uh, brothers, I'm telling you, subhanAllah, this ministry... This ministry is destroying Islam. Wallahi al-Azim. If you can't see it, please ask Allah to open up your minds and your hearts, brothers. This ministry is destroying Islam. It has the semblance of Islam. It has the coding of Islam. But when you go inside the actual material itself, you see, you hear Masonism, Masonism, you hear Hinduism, you hear Buddhism, you hear Pantheism, you hear Pantheism, you hear Baptism, you hear Rosicrucianism, you hear all kinds of crazy stuff, Greek and Roman philosophy, Persian mythology. When you go deep into what they're saying, subhanAllah, it's destroying this land. Now, he already has. It just hasn't been put between two covers. He already has for 20 years. It just hasn't been put between two covers, that's all. Yeah. Okay, let's continue, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, this next chapter, we've already dealt with the chapter, repentance had wipes out previous sins, and the other chapter, will Allah forgive me? And what shall I do when I have sinned? And this next chapter, the companions... The companions of sin chase me. You may say, the sheikh says, I would like to repent and I would like to change my ways, but my former evil companions pursue me wherever I go. No sooner do they know of a change in me than they launch an attack on me and I feel myself weak against them. What shall I do? The answer is, bear with patience for this in the way of Allah. This is how he tries his slaves in order for everyone to know who the true ones are and who the phony. And in order and the who are the phony. And in order that he may distinguish, and Allah of course already knows, the pervert from the from the righteous. Once you have taken the path to virtue, persevere. These evil people who are Satan of the jinn and men will conspire with each other in order to turn you back from the path of reformation. Therefore listen to them not. They will say about you what you are attempting, that this is an infatuation that will not last, that it is a passing crisis, and soon you will recover, and so on. So the sheikh says, in fact, it was heard that a man said about his former companion who had begun to change his life, what evil has fallen into you? No wonder, the sheikh says, that when a young man put down the rest put down the receiver refusing to talk to his former girlfriend after he had decided he would change his life she dialed him after a few days to tell him that she had hoped by then he was cured of his evil inspirations it is for such situations <coughs> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he reveals قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس. Say, I take refuge with the Lord of the people, the King of the people, the God of the people, from the evil of the secret whispers or whisperings 
and one who whispers in the breasts of men of jinn and mankind. The Sheikh says then, Is your Lord then more worthy of obedience or these evil companions? You should also know that they will chase you in every place and will employ every means to win you back to their ways. A young man confided to me that his former girlfriend used to... Remember now, brothers, that all this stuff is going on in Saudi Arabia. This is in Saudi Arabia. The Sheikh lives in Saudi Arabia. You should also know that they will chase you in every place and will employ every means to win you back in their ways. A young man once confided to me that his former girlfriend used to order his chauffeur to drive behind him. See, because in Saudi Arabia, they have these Filipinos and these other people, Pakistanis, who drive the cars for them. And when the man is at work, you know, the woman needs to go around because the women don't drive there. The Filipino or whoever drives the woman around. She sits in the back seat. He drives her, takes her shopping or whatever. All right? She used to chide in and taste him through the window of her car while he would be heading for the masjid. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَسْقُطُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابَةِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ Allah grants firmness with the firm word to those who have believed in this world so that he will in the so, and so he will in the hereafter. I'd like to take this opportunity, this is in Surah Ibrahim, just to, to uh, on the heels of what, uh, or after the statement we just made about interpreting the Qur'an um, on your own. This particular ayah says, وَيَثْبِتُ, وَيَثْبِتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا or وَيُثَبِّتُ وَيُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَيُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا hmm? Yeah. With, with Hassan Asim is وَيَثْبِتُ وَيُثَبِّتُ is Warsh. Alhamdulillah. Allah Akbar. He's reminding me that there's two different ways you can read it because of the different ways that Allah revealed the recitation of the Quran. SubhanAllah. Anyway, it says that Allah is going to make firm, He's going to make firm this qawlu sabit. They translate it here as with a firm word. Now, I want you brothers, of course not deliberately, you know, what does firm word mean here? Your heart. You say your heart. Wrong. What does firm word mean here? You go to the dictionary, look at the word al qaw. You go to the dictionary, look at the word sabit. Qaw means statement, sabit means firm. But what does it mean together? Huh? No. It means La ilaha illallah. When you go back to the tafsir, it says that the firm word means La ilaha illallah. That's the meaning. That's the meaning that the messenger of Allah said. Now if you have another meaning, you're saying you receive a revelation. See how difficult it is? It's not that easy, brothers. You look at the dictionary, you see the Arabic language, the word's clear, al qawr sabit firm word, but it means La ilaha illallah. So this is very dangerous, brothers. We have to be very careful. One of the means, one of the one of the means these evil companions of sin will employ to entice you will be to remind you of the pleasures of the sins of the past through mementos, messages, pictures, letters, and so on. But do not pay attention to them, and be reminded of the story of Kaab ibn Malik, radiyallahu anhu. He was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who had stayed back from the Tabuk campaign, when, as a punishment, the Prophet ﷺ ordered that he was to be boycotted by everyone until Allah cleared him. Then the Ghassan king, or the Ghassanid in English, the Ghassanid king wrote to him a letter in which he said, I am to learn that your man, meaning Prophet Muhammad, has abandoned you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But you are not the kind of person that should be, should be belittled and wasted. Join us. We will treat you much better. What was the reaction of the companion, Ka'ab ibn Malik? He said, when I read the letter, I said to myself, this is yet another trial for my Lord. Then I threw it into the fire. See, if you don't know the whole story, you don't probably get to appreciate, you don't appreciate the real sweetness of this statement. If you go through the whole hadith, which is a very long hadith, you can find it in Riyad al-Salihin. And then you'll maybe be able to get the, the sweetness of this last statement that he, in this, in this, on this page. So the sheikh says, this is how, my dear young, or dear young man or woman, you should treat those things sent to you to win you back. Burn them. Burn them to ashes. And say, well, and, and then remember what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, وَاصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٌ وَلَا يَسْتَخْفَنَنْ وَلَا يَسْتَخْفَنَّكَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَسْتَخِفَنَّكَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُقِنُونَ Allah yubarakfiq. 
Be patient, for Allah's promise is true, and let not those who do not believe weaken you. Be patient, for Allah's promise is true, and let not those who do not believe weaken you. No companions threaten me that they will, rev they will reveal my past activities and publish my secrets among the people using those pictures and other proofs they have and thus disgrace me. So what shall I do? Al-Jawab, the answer, we say, fight back against these friends of the shaitan and rest assured that the tricks of the devil are weak. These are some of the tactics of shaitan but will avail nothing before the patience and perseverance of a believer firm in his belief. And also know that if you try to please them and yield to them, there is no end to their demands on you. You will destroy yourself altogether in the end. Rather, do not pay attention to them. Do what is right and say, Allah is enough for me. He is the best of supporters. <clears throat> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he feared a people, he used to say, Allahumma inna naja'aluka fi luhurihim wa na'udhu bika min shururihim. O oh Allah, I seek, I beseech you to take them by their throats and I seek for ourselves your protection against their mistress and their evils. True. The Sheikh says, it is not always easy. That girl, for instance, is in a great fix who is told by her former boyfriend that he has recorded all her conversations and has preserved all the pictures and will send them to her relatives if she will refuse to date him. She is certainly not in an enviable situation. This is exactly what happened with those singers and actors that repented. <laughs> their former friends and companions distributed some of their pictures in the markets in order to apply psychological pressure on them and force them back to their own company. He is the friend of the believers in him. He is the friend of the believers in him. He does not waste them. He does not ignore them. Never has it happened that a man sought his protection, Tabaraka wa ta'ala, and he refused him. Also know that with every hardship comes ease, and it should be after every hardship comes ease. And after every impasse comes an opening. We offer you at this juncture the story of a companion of the Prophet who used to help in the escape and immigration of the weak people from Mecca to al Madinah. The report runs as follows. <clears throat> there was a man in Mecca called Marathad, Ibn Abi Marathad, radiallahu anhu, who used to help in the escape of the captured Muslims at Mecca until they had reached Medina. There was also a woman, and let me find this because I forgot, I think it's Anaq. Right. There was also a woman in Mecca called Anaq. She was his girlfriend. And I'd like to add something to this because uh, I don't know if the hadith says it, but uh, Anaq was not only his girlfriend, Anaq, according to the tafsir, because this hadith is connected to a verse in Quran in Surah An Nur. In Surah An Nur, chapter 24. She was also a prostitute. She was his girlfriend and she was a prostitute. So she was his sadiqa. She was his girlfriend. This Marathad had promised a prisoner help in his escape to Medina. He narrates the story himself. And I want to remind the brothers that there's a principle among the scholars of Hadith. Uh, Ibn al-Hajr al-Asqalani, he brings this principle. And also uh, Ibn al-Iraqi, al-Iraqi, excuse me. He brings this principle from Usul al-Hadith that the person who narrates the Hadith, the Rawi, the narrator of the Hadith, is... Adra, from the one who didn't narrate. He's more knowledgeable of the circumstances of the hadith than the one who didn't narrate it. Alright? So Marathad is narrating the hadith himself. It says, He said, I went to the place where the man was imprisoned and hid myself under the shadow of one of the Meccan walls. It was a full moon night. It so happened that Anak passed by. She saw my shadow by the side of the wall, and when she reached me, she recognized me. Is that Marathad? I said, Nam, Ahlan, welcome, Marhaban. She said, Come and spend the night with me. I said, Dear Anaq, Allah has forbidden zina. 
Suddenly she cried out, People, here's the man who used to steal away your prisoners. Some eight men began to chase me, Martha said. I climbed the wall outside of Mecca, and, and this wall, because it's in English, I want to get the right spelling of this wall. al Khandama. There was a, <clears throat> a mountain. He said, I climbed a mountain outside of Mecca called uh, Khandama and hid in a cave. They were right on top of me at the mouth of the cave. But Allah blinded them, and they returned, giving up the chase. After it was all cool, I, and this is in parentheses, he didn't say after it was all cool. <laughs> the translator threw it in there, you know, so he can relate to us, I guess. After it was all cool, and maybe that does mean that, you know, when everything is cool, because we don't want to be near the heat, right? I also returned and picked up the tied prisoner. I returned and picked up the tied prisoner. And then I said, I swear by Allah, he was a heavy man, right? He was trying to carry him. I carried him until we had reached the grasslands. Then I freed him from his chains. Then I carried him again, and probably he was injured. Uh, uh, and the translation is, is actually literally says probably, said he's probably he was injured. And he gave me a hard time. At last we reached al Medina. There, when I went to meet the Prophet wasallam, I asked him if he would allow me to marry Anak. I asked him the question twice. But he gave no reply. Can somebody have a, can somebody give me Surah Nur? Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse 3. He said, I asked him the question twice, but he gave no reply until Allah... Boy, you... <laughs> you one of them has got arthritis, man. <laughs> until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed this ayah that Mikhail Hatcher on the tape is trying to find, we still fumbling. <laughs> he revealed this ayah. As Zani la yanki'u illa zaniyatan aw mushrikatan wa zaniyatu la yanki'u ha illa zanin aw mushrik. Wa hurrima thalika ala al mu'mineen. May Allah reward you for your intention. Huh? <laughs> an adulterer does not marry but an adulteress or an idolatress. And an, adul- an adulteress does not marry but an adulterer or an idolater. The Prophet then told me, Murfid, a fornicator does not marry but a fornicator, fornicatress or an idolaterer. And a fornicatress does not marry but a fornicator or an idolater. Therefore, don't marry her. So the Sheikh says, Do you see how Allah defends those who believe in Him and how He bestows His favors upon them? Nevertheless, let us suppose that worse could, that worse came, comes worse. They publish things about you. They publish things about you that you hate to be published. But you can always explain your position to the people. Tell them, yes, once I was in the wrong, but now I have repented. What do those, what do those who are publishing these things want of me now? And let us all remember that true disgrace is that of the hereafter. This is true disgrace. When a man will be exposed not in the presence of a hundred or two hundred or thousand or two thousand people, but in the presence of millions of jinn, the angels and men, starting from Adam until the last man. Subhanallah. To the pr- that's disgrace, right, us? That's disgrace. And you see how how dangerous it is for people to make verses of Quran allegorical. See, when you make a verse allegorical that's clear and the meaning is true, it makes your nafs go further out in destruction because you don't apply what is literally going to happen to you to the reality of the issue. So when things are allegorical, when you don't make that dua, when you go in the bathroom, Allahumma inni a'udhu bikim al-khubti wal khaba'is. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you, stepping in the bathroom with your left foot. With, uh, I seek refuge with you from the male and female jinn. So now when you say that a jinn is really a person who has weak ideas, wrong thinking, and lies, or a person who has a fiery nature, see, you don't believe it's real jinns in there. So now you're subject to the real jinn harming you when you get in the bathroom. You see the danger of changing the meaning of stuff and not taking it away the message of Allah, explained it and the companions understood it? you setting yourself up. No, that doesn't really mean that. That doesn't really mean that. This doesn't really mean this. It means that. Wait till that fire gets to you. You'll really realize, may Allah forbid, 
that that wasn't allegorical when your skin be burned up and keep being replaced. See if that's allegorical. <clears throat> anyway, the Sheikh goes on, he says, to the prayer then of Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, where he said, <clears throat> and O our Lord, degrade me not upon the day they will be raised up, the day when neither wealth nor offsprings shall be of any profit. And this is the day, of course, that Allah says, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except those individuals who come to Allah with a pure, clean heart. So the Shaykh says, And seek strength with the following prayers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. اللَّهُمَّ اسْتُرْ عَوْرَاتَنَا عَوْرَاتِنَا no, awratana wa amin wa rawatina. It should be awratina, it should be. Yeah, but he has awratina. Allahumma stur awratina wa amin wa rawatina. Allahumma jal sa'orana ala man zalamana. One sur ala man baga alayna. Allahumma la tuthbit bina li a'da'ana wa la al-hafidin. O Allah, screen our secrets. This is a beautiful dua. We should memorize this one. O Allah, screen our secrets and grant us peace in place of fear. And grant us peace in the place of fear. O Allah, help us direct our vengeance towards those who wrong us. Mm. See, this is another proof. Like Muslims who keep saying, you know, we should love everybody. We shouldn't, you know, we should just be nice. We love everybody. You don't hate people. No, Allah's Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most pious and most loving of individuals, the most clement of individuals, the most fit, uh, forbearing of individuals, look what he said to uh, ask Allah. Oh Allah, help us direct our vengeance towards those who wrong us. <laughs> See? And help us against those who press us, oppress us. Oh Allah, don't let our enemies, let not our enemies nor those who envy us rejoice over our failures. Amin. Allahumma stajib. Oh Allah, answer these dua. Past sins haunt me. You may say, I committed my sins. I committed many sins. But even after I've repented, I am haunted by their memories. They spoil my simple pleasures and the quiet of my nights. What's the solution? Al-Jawab, the answer is, Dear brother in Islam, it is as follows. These feelings of reproach are in fact proofs of the sincerity of your repentance. This indeed is the regret that is desirable, the regret which has been equated with repentance. But your hope should be that Allah will forgive all sins and do not despair. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the English translation that is, and despair not but those that are misguided. And despair not, in other words, and those who do don't despair, those are the mis or those who despair not, but and despair not, but those that are misguided. I don't think this translation is a really good translation. Surah Al-Hijr. Surah Al-Hijr is 15? 56? No, that's the verse. I think Hijr is 15. Let's see what uh, one of the translations, the worst translations according to Armaya Nortman says about this. The one that he told everybody to beware of. قَالَ وَمَنْ يَقْنُطْ بِالرَّحْمَةِ رَبِّهِ and who despairs of the mercy of his Lord except those who are straight? There you go. That's better, right? Much better. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is reported to have said, he is reported to have said, the greatest of sins are akbar al-kabair al-ishraku billah wal-amnu min makr allah والقنوط من رحمة الله واليأس من روح الله ومن روح الله. The greatest of sins are to ascribe pardons unto Allah, to be unmindful of Allah's strategy, and to despair of Allah's mercy. And the word strategy here means uh, the plot of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. The plot of Allah. Then the Sheikh goes on. He says. A believer is always between fear and hope. The believer is always between al-khawf wal-raja. 
Maybe one of them will weigh more on him in a particular situation. For instance, when he, when he sins, when he sins, fear overwhelms him and which drives him to repent. But when he has repented, then hope overtakes him and he seeks forgiveness. <clears throat> the next part is, do I confess? Someone may ask, I would like to repent, but is it necessary for me to confess to someone and declare my sins before him? It is a condition of repentance, or is it a condition of repentance that I should go to the Qadi, remember now, this is still, this is in Saudi Arabia, because they have the Qudat, they have the judges. Is it a condition of repentance that I go to the Qadi in the court, recount all my crimes and seek to be punished? And what else, what else, and what else the stories of Ma'iz, the Ramadi woman, and the man who kissed a girl in a garden suggest? Let me tell you, my brother, that's a, that's a man's direct contact with his Lord, without any intermediaries, is an important, oh, excuse me, let me tell you, he says, brothers, that a man's direct contact with his Lord without any intermediaries is an important aspect of the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> or the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his uniqueness, which he demands from all of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكِ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ And when my slaves ask you, O Muhammad, about me, whether I am close to them or at distance, let them know that. And I don't know why the brother said why the, whether I'm, I'm uh, close to them or at a distance. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he's close. And Allah doesn't say that he's, a dis that he's distant. So this is just once again, this is just a reminder that we have to study these principles of Al-Aqidah. Because you see now the translator, he put in here whether I am close to them or at a distance. Allah is never at a distance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to us, closer than this, our shrouds. But where he is, as he says in his book, he's over his throne in a manner befitting his majesty. He himself is over his throne, but his vision and his power and his hearing is close to us. So the shaykh goes on, he says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <clears throat> وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ الدَّعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانٌ When my servants ask you about me, O Muhammad, tell them that I am close, I answer the prayers of him who calls me. And when we admit that repentance is for the sake of Allah, then the confessions of sin should also be, should also be to Allah alone. In fact, the words of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in his prayer, and this is a very uh, beautiful prayer that we should try to, to um, try to memorize. Allah's Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this prayer that he called Sayyidul Istighfar. It is the master and the leader of all the du'as for seeking forgiveness of Allah. Allahumma anta Rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqtani ana abduka wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'atika ma stata'tu wa a'udhu bika min sharri ma sana'tu أبوء لك بنعمتك علي وأبوء بذنبي فاغفر لي فإنه لا يغفر ذنوب إلا أنت. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "This is the master of all du'as, the leader of all the du'as of seeking forgiveness. Whoever says this in the evening, when they go to bed and they die, they die in iman, and inshallah they'll go to jannah. And whoever says it in the morning and they died after saying it, Allah's Prophet said they die in iman and they go to jannah. The statement that the Sheikh brings in this book." I acknowledge your blessings and confess my sins to you. And why does the Messenger of Allah say, I acknowledge my bless your blessings? As Allah says, Which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? Because denying the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kufr. It's kufr. They call it juhur al ni'mah. Or kufr al ni'mah. Denying for repudiating the grace that Allah has given you. Allah has given you a good Muslim son. A good Muslim son. You should be proud of it, and you should recognize that Allah has given you a good Muslim son. Allah has given you a voice to recite the Quran. Abu Ulaka bin Amatika Aliyah. Oh Allah, I recognize that you've done this. You don't use it to show off, but you're supposed to recognize Allah has given you a voice to recite the Quran. Whatever Allah has given you, you should never say, as some people, Shaitan will whisper to us, and the, the, our nuts will whisper to us, and in our uh, attempt to be humble and not have sum'ah, having a great reputation, 
or riyah, or being one to be seen ostentatious, shaitan will reverse it and try to make you super righteous and say, oh no, I really don't understand Arabic language. And you have a PhD in Arabic, you're a master in Arabic language, oh no brother, I really, you know, I really don't understand the Arabic language, I don't know. This is kufr. This is kufr ni'mah. You're denying that ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. You see how shaitan works? So we have to remember all the time what the Prophet sallallahu said, Abu Ulaka bi ni'matika alayya, Oh my Lord, I recognize the ni'mah you've given me, but at the same time, wa abu bi zambi. You see, I also recognize those sins I've been committing. Even though the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sinless, he made this dua. How much more us? The Messenger of Allah was sinless. Subhanallah. So, the Sheikh goes on. And did I lose the page like that? <clears throat> oh, I got over here. Oh, man. Subhanallah. It came out, huh? What page was this? You saw it? 30? Okay. Uh, I'm going to tell that publisher, man, to get these books together. These pages are falling out, man. Uh, no problem, inshallah. Just don't let the pages of Iman fall out of your heart. We are not by the grace of Allah, like the Christians, the priests, the chair of confession, the certificate of pardon, and so forth. In contrast, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the English translation is, do they not know that it is Allah who accepts, who accepts the penitence of the penitence? <clears throat> as for the administration of punishment, as prescribed by the Sharia, and as judged by the courts, what can be said is that it is not necessary for a man to go to the authorities and confess his sins. For him who Allah has screened it is of no harm if he screens himself. His repentance before his Lord will suffice for him. In fact, one of the 99 names of Allah, and let me find this. Just please be patient with me, brothers, because I think the translator made a very serious statement here. You see, this is one of the things, once again, you can know the Arabic language, but if you don't know these principles of usul, al-aqidah, and tafsir, and things like this, you can make some serious mistakes, even though, you have, even though you've mastered the, the, the Arabic language. Now, in the English here, he says, he says here, where's that part? Okay, they may have... Uh, uh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Here it says, um, he, his repentance before his Lord will suffice him. In fact, one of the 99 names of Allah, and they have here, if you read it in the English, it says Satir. Satir. And this is not one of the names of Allah. Satir is not one of the names of Allah. Hmm? No, 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 no. No, no, he's on the right track. But it's just that when, they, when he translated it, if you read it the way he's translated it, this is not one of the names of Allah. And this is one of the principles of uh, our belief in Tawheed, Asma wa Sifat. That is, that Allah's names are Tawqifi. Allah's names are Tawqifi. Tawqifi means you stop at what Allah calls himself, and you don't change the meaning of Allah's names, you don't deny the meaning of Allah's names, and you don't bring synonyms. This is very serious. You don't bring synonyms to Allah's names. For instance, <clears throat> Allah, one of Allah's names is al karim a, a direct synonym, the exact same meaning to Kareem is Sahi. Sahi, sahi means, in the name of this brother's language is Arabic, you know Sahi, what does Sahi mean? Kareem. Sahi means Kareem, Kareem means Sahi. But it's not permissible to call Allah Sahi. It's not permissible. Even though they have the exact same meaning. Why? Because Allah didn't call himself that. See how serious it is? So you call Allah divine mind, higher power. See? SubhanAllah, this is dangerous. And we say we believe in Tawheed. You see? But it's much more than saying Allah is one. It's much more than that. You see? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a name. And that name is Satir, with a Shadda, a Satir, not Satir, not Satir, and not Satar, like the brother downtown, I'm not trying to expose him or anything, but unfortunately, some people don't know in the Arab world, they name their children names that are not 
proper. Like the brother downtown uh, has the uh, flying angel, flying angel, angel, flying, flying angel. His name is Abdul Sattar, right? The people around the world, they name their children this, Sattar, because they think Allah's name is Sattar, but his name is Satir. And Sattar and Satir and Satir, they almost have the same meaning. They're very close. The one who screens and veils. But you can't call Allah what he didn't call himself. You can't do it. It's haram to call Allah by a name that he didn't call himself. All right? So there's a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu he called Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Sitir. And we know this from this uh, hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, the meaning of it is, إِذَا أَتَى أَحَدُكُمُ الْبَيْتِ الْخَلَاءِ when any of you goes to the bathroom to relieve himself or whatever, فَلْيَسْتَتِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيِّيٌّ سِتِّرْ وَيُحِبُّ عَنْ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ أَنْ يَسْتَتِرْ This is the hadith, inshallah. When any of you goes to the bathroom, then he should veil himself, clean himself, so he won't be seen. For surely Allah is حَيِّيٌّ سِتِّرْ Allah is the shy in a manner befitting his majesty, and he is the veiler in a manner befitting his majesty. And he loves from his service that they veil themselves. So that's the proof that Allah is, one of his names is Sitir. And if you look on those so-called 99 name charts, you don't find it. Why? It's because those 99 name charts are wrong. All them charts you see in the masjids and in people's houses, says the 99 names of Allah, they are wrong. But some names on there are not Allah's names. Like Ar-Rashid. That's not a name of Allah. Ar-Rashid if you, if you name yourself Abdul Rashid, you're not calling yourself by one of the names of Allah. No. Okay. He, Allah is the guy. He's Al-Hadi, but Rashid is not one of his names. So is Al-Baqi. That's not one of the names. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, man. Of course you hear it all the time. This is why the only da'wah that's, that's leading people to the right way is the da'wah of the salaf. Because these people are people who are concerned with everything. They're meticulous on everything, including the authenticity of hadith. Every single hadith that calls Allah Rashid in the 99 names is unauthentic. Who? The salaf, the people, people who follow the way of the book of Allah, the authentic sunnah, and the way of the sahaba and the tabi'un and those who came after them. By just that. People who follow the Quran strictly, the Sunnah of the Prophet, and those who are the, com the way the, um, the companions understood it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But this is a big mistake. Rashid is not one, or Rashid is not one of the names of Allah. Alright? And for those who say, or those who go back to your hadith, Sahih Muslim, and you look under the names of Allah, and you see that whole list on that page, right? Or the 99 names. The translator, because he was ignorant of this, he took the unauthentic hadith from Abu Dawood and the Tirmidhi and superimposed it onto the page where Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, Inna lillahi tis'a wa tis'ina isman, man ahsaha dakhla al jannah. Allah has 99 names, whoever enumerates them or remembers them, understands them and implements them will go to jannah. He took that unauthentic hadith and put it on the page right under that hadith so you think that Muslim brings that whole hadith and brings the names but that hadith that part with all the names Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Al-Malik Al-Quddus Al-Salam Al-Mu'min Al-Muhaymin Al-Aziz Al-Jabbar Al-Mutakabbir right that, 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 that hadith is not authentic and there's not any there's not one hadith that gives you all 99 names as authentic not one that's authentic anyway there is no list the list is brought from the Quran and the Sunnah and you put it together Yes, I just said, the Prophet said, Allah has 99 names, but they're not listed in one hadith. They're not listed. No, they're not listed in order. That's what I just said. You have to take them from the Quran, those people who have knowledge, have taken them from the Quran, and taken them from the hadith, and they put them together, and they come up with 99. All right? But there's no one list.